so last time we were looking at uh, the Reformation in England and some of the details about that and how that uh, developed and how it progressed. Now I want to return to uh, the continent of Europe and also this, this will include England. Uh, this, this what I'm going to talk about now influenced England as well, but it started back on the continent. So I want to return there and talk to you about a movement called Pietism. Again, we're proceeding from the time of the Reformation and kind of trying to bring history up to the more modern times. So let's talk about Pietism. Let me read a quote to you from one of my textbooks, uh, The Church from Age to Age. This was a great history book, rather thick, but it's a good book. Uh, let me read you a, a quote here about Pietism. It says, quote, A long period of controversy followed the rediscovery of the gospel by the 16th century Protestant reformers. The quarrels that resulted from the breakup of the medieval church led to definition of the Protestant position. The philosophy of Aristotle was used by participants in debates to express their ideas. The Christological issue among the Lutherans, the predestinarian disputes among the Reformed, and the debate between both of them over the Lord's Supper encouraged precise definition of doctrine. Now, the religious orthodoxy that came about after 1600, after the Reformation, as they were working all these things out, you see, it resulted in uh, a religion, in, in Christianity becoming a religion of the head, an intellectual religion. It was all about, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's theologically. It's what always happens. You, you have theological debate, so you get into it more and more and more, and you end up kind of going too far that way. It's this pendulum swing thing that we always see throughout history on all sorts of issues, including church issues, theological issues. But all the debate over doctrine produced this religion of the head, an intellectual religion, right? And so that created a kind of a dead orthodoxy where you you got to have all the facts right, but it's pretty boring, and there's not much life or vibrancy to it. In addition to that, we talked about the Peace of Westphalia that kind of brought an end to the Thirty Years' War, right? Well, that had produced a situation in which the prince of each uh, region decided the religion of that area. Remember, we talked about that. The prince would decide the religion because they were having too much trouble, so they just said, whatever the political leader there is into whatever his religion is, that's what the whole region will have to uh, follow. Whether it was Roman Catholicism or Lutheranism or Calvinism, uh, it was whatever the, the government said, right? And so what that ended up producing was that basically the state kind of ran the church. So um, that also had a negative effect. It also kind of stifled real spirituality. And so in this kind of a situation where you had this pendulum swing way over here into the area of the intellect and orthodoxy and all that kind of stuff, pietism developed as a reaction to that state of affairs. This is what always happens. And so it, it was something in which people came to, to seek a religion of the heart again. That's what it's about. They wanted, um, you know, something that touched their heart. And, um, and so uh, uh, pietism was a movement. It wasn't just a denomination. It was kind of like what we'll talk about later, the charismatic movement. It's something that developed within various other movements or segments. For example, it had roots in Puritanism and also amongst the radical reformers, the Anabaptists and so forth, and some of the mystics and mysticism. But, but what it was is that pietism, uh, and for pietists, the Christian life was no longer all this, you know, harmonizing of faith and reason, which had been going on for really a couple hundred years. Instead, it was more about a person's feelings, your heart being warmed toward God and so forth. And it was expressed more in a life of service for others. It made faith very individualistic as well. Now, the founder or the father of pietism was a guy named Philip Jacob Spenner, or you can say Spenner. Okay, he was a German, and uh, he, he lived, you'll see the years of his life there on the screen, but 
he uh, he's called the father of pietism and then his successor was a man named August Hermann Franke and um, the the pietists influenced people who became great influencers a little bit after this time for example the Moravian denomination and John and Charles Wesley the Wesleys and so they they played a key and strategic role of course as always whenever there's a movement of God there's also controversy that goes with it with it and some people find fault and some people say you're a heretic and so forth and some of them probably were heretical but Franken was a tireless guy great administrator and he really pushed and he really expanded the influence of pietism and all of this uh, kind of uh, movement and for heartfelt religion that was going on and uh, he made Halle which is a German town kind of the center of it you know the center of pietism and it became a ascending center for Lutheran missions because he was Lutheran and so basically most Lutheran churches in America to this time can trace their origins back to Franke and to Halle and to the influence of the pietists the Puritan minister Cotton Mather I mentioned him last time he said uh, that basically that there was a fire burning in Germany and the world would eventually feel its heat and he was referring to pietism so people became aware that there was this revival kind of thing going on in Germany that uh, with pietism and uh, it had a great influence the Church of the Brethren and the Moravians sprang from pietism so I want to talk about them just a little bit the Church of the Brethren uh, was we have that denomination with us today uh, their founder was a guy named Alexander Mack he came under the influence of pietism and he formed a group of people who wanted to be a biblical church isn't that interesting I, always, I like that these people they, 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 they're keen to follow God and so they want to join together with others of the same mindset and I think that's just really great and they want to form a biblical church boy I'm looking for people like that aren't you people who want to be a biblical church so they settled in this one area of Germany where there was religious freedom however after they'd been there not that very long the Holy Roman Empire began to close in on them with persecution you know I've said before the Holy Roman Empire would kind of ebb and flow and change its borders and boundaries and so forth and grow in strength and weaken and, and so on so uh, after they found this place why well, then the Holy Roman Empire began to close in on them and persecute them so they end up leaving that area most fled over to Holland to the Netherlands but some ended up going to America because a man we mentioned in an earlier discussion William Penn who uh, was a Quaker he was looking for recruits to come to his colony of Pennsylvania because he needed workers and so forth so he went back to Europe a few times and went around trying to recruit and he happened to come upon these folks who were you know Church of the Brethren folks and he said hey why don't you come over and join us you can have freedom of religion among us even though he was a Quaker he didn't insist on people being Quakers you can have freedom of religion but we need you to come and move in and work and build houses and and help us to develop our colony and so a lot of these folks did move over there to Pennsylvania and they started a town called get this Germantown in 1719 and I remember I was born in Maryland it's not that far away and I remember my parents talking about Germantown because there were all these German people see and they came because of religious persecution and so forth and um, there but some of the Church of the Brethren folks stayed in Europe and most of them joined other groups that were sort of like-minded like Anabaptists uh, or, or the Mennonites and that sort of thing so that's just very little bit but it, it it's sort of a, a movement that came out of pietism now another movement that uh, I know more about is the Moravian movement my parents actually used to go to a Moravian church in Maryland uh, where I was born uh, when I was very young but the Moravian movement came out of pietism or was heavily influenced by it the founder of this movement really was a guy named uh, Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf and uh, he was Jacob Spanner's godson you know God sent as a person who's there at your christening and so forth and swears to uh, to watch out for you and guide you in spiritual ways and so forth so Jacob Spanier the founder of pietism was the, the godfather of uh, Ludwig von Zinzendorf and Zinzendorf's grandmother raised him and check this out she this lady she could read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek 
and she could get into deep theological discussion. So that's the kind of heritage he had and the kind of grandmother he had. Reminds me of uh, Timothy in the Bible, right? Who had his, both his grandmother and his mother, Eunice and Lois, they, they, uh, they instructed him and Paul wrote about them. But um, <clears throat> Zinzendorf was deeply influenced by this godly grandmother and her knowledge of scripture and discussion about theology and so forth. And so uh, he wanted to be a minister, uh, you know, but it turned out that he couldn't be because he was a prince. He was a count anyway, so a, a, a leader of his region. And so um, remember the treaty or the peace of Westphalia had said that a region had to uh, adapt the religion of its leader. And if a leader was to change his religion, well, then he'd have to step down and leave. So... Um, Zinzendorf, you know, couldn't uh, couldn't be a minister because he's a he's a secular uh, civil ruler. He's a count, and uh, his his uh, area would have to change and everything if he changed. And so he didn't do that. Instead, he went into the study of law, but he was always very deeply religious. Now, at a certain point, he received a big inheritance, and so what he did with that is he went and he purchased a property in Moravia. Moravia is kind of the Czech Republic. Uh, Kind of more than that, it's it, but it's in that area of Europe. And so he brought the, he bought this property in Moravia, and he decided you know he wanted to use it for the Lord. So he, he heard about these uh, religious refugees who were coming from areas uh, where the Holy Roman Empire was persecuting them, and he offered to them that they could settle on his land there. Uh, they came from the old uh, Moravian Hussite Church. That's named for Jan Hus or John Hus. You know, the uh, priest who was one of the forerunners of the Reformation who was burned at the stake by the Catholic Church. So there was a whole uh, movement uh, of those folks who had followed uh, John Huss, and that was called the Hussite or Hussite Church. And so that's what these believers were who came over into uh, Zinzendorf's turf there. And uh, he let them settle there and build houses and stuff. And uh, they built a village called Hernhut, Hernhut, or Hernhut. And um, that is, uh, can be translated either as on watch for the Lord or watched over by the Lord. They wanted, these people did, they wanted to return to biblical practices. It's another group of zealous folks who wanted to really get back to the Bible and live as the Bible taught, right? And so uh, they, uh, they, they had an intense, uh, close-knit community life. They really believed in communion, being together a lot and uh, working together and praying together and everything. They believed in such things as foot washing, the kiss of peace, casting of lots, and things like that. But one special trait that they had is they were people of prayer, and they gave themselves to continual prayer. And uh, in fact, it is said that they kept a, a, an ongoing prayer meeting uh, for, they kept it going for a hundred years. Can you imagine? Today we have IHOP in Kansas City where they've been praying nonstop, uh, 24 hours a day, for I think it's 12 or 15 years now. So they kind of pattern themselves after this group of uh, Moravians there in Moravia, in Hernhut, where they had this incredible prayer meeting, prayer ministry going on literally for a hundred years. And so out of all that prayer that they were doing, continual prayer and waiting on God and seeking God, these folks ended up becoming very mission-minded. And if you give yourself to God and you seek God and you spend time with God, that's, that's something that's liable to happen to you. I'll just warn you. Prayer breeds missions. And so this group, the Moravians, they actually launched out more missionaries per capita, so to speak, or percentage-wise, than just about any other movement that's ever been. They really did. They, they had like an incredible percentage of their folks who went as missionaries and were, were, you know, they had a lot of neat uh, tactics about that too, by the way, I could go into some other time, but just briefly, I'll tell you that, you know, they would send people and they would get jobs. They would work as carpenters or house builders or whatever, and they make a living. And then through that, they would begin preaching the gospel and so forth. And, and so they were really dedicated and um, they sent missionaries all over, like uh, to the West Indies, the Americas, Greenland, Georgia, just a lot of different places Moravians went. And um, uh, by the way, uh, Zinzendorf was quite a man. He traveled around a lot. He was a count. He was a nobleman. And um, he had influence. 
He actually devised the plan to reconcile the Roman Catholics, the Orthodox, and the Protestants, but of course it, it never came to fruition, but he was even seeking things like that. But it's, um, it's just so uh, important, uh, the Moravian movement, they're not much today, but they really were powerful for, for a while there, about a hundred years. And one thing that was especially, um, especially important and, and, uh, and of great impact about the Moravians is, is the influence that they had upon a man named John Wesley. Um, if you know anything about the story of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, why he went to Georgia as a missionary when he was an Anglican priest before he was even truly converted. And it was Moravians who on the, the trip over from England to the New World on that ship, when they were in a storm, it was the Moravians who were singing hymns and and they were really demonstrating their faith in Christ, and 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 sh they were they made John Wesley see that something was wrong in his life, and he wasn't really born again yet. And they had a great influence on him, and uh, they planted the seeds in his life that eventually brought him to salvation. And after he got saved, he did go to Hernhut, and uh, he did communicate with various Moravians from time to time, and he learned a lot in the early years from them. And um, uh, but. Uh, these guys, the Moravians, they were they came out of uh, pietism, and uh, they uh, wanted to live a holy life with moral, moral purity. They emphasized new birth and this individual experience of salvation. All of that was was something that they really got from pietism. Now, the 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 pietists uh, influenced the Moravians. They also uh, and the Moravians influenced John Wesley, which I mentioned. John Wesley was influenced by other uh, uh, factors in his life as well. He was influenced by pietism, and not just the pietism of the Moravians, but his mother and father were influenced by pietism. And so uh, John Wesley uh, was one of the guys that most people say he started the Methodist Church, but it's actually not true. There were many of them who started it together. Um, Methodism was originally a revival movement. And if you want to know the truth, I've read quite a bit about this, but uh, it really uh, seems pretty uh, clear from history that George Whitfield was the, the real uh, spark plug who got Methodism started. And then he is the one who brought John Wesley in and got him preaching in the fields and stuff like that. And, um, and uh, but then there were various others, right? But um, the movement got started, you know, through Whitfield and through the Wesleys especially, they were friends and they went to Oxford University together. And when they were there, they were members of something called the Holy Club. And so they were all training to be Anglican ministers. They all became ordained Church of England ministers. Um, but these guys were part of this Holy Club and they used to fast twice a week and they used to study scripture and pray a lot and so forth. And uh, it was, it's really quite a story. You ought to study about the Methodist movement someday. But uh, in the beginning, George Whitfield started preaching to these people out in fields because not all Anglican ministers would accept him in the church. Some did. And, and uh, there were these guys were traveling around preaching in the Anglican churches wherever they could. And, uh, but they were bringing revival there. And then some Anglicans said, no, we don't want that. It's, it's enthusiasm. It's uh, extremism. And so they said, well, we're not going to be stopped by you. And they went out and preached wherever they could. And uh, sometimes these guys would preach up to 10 times a day. And Wesley, he would just get on his horse and ride over here and he'd be there at five in the morning and he'd preach and then he'd take off from there and he'd preach over this other place at six or seven or whatever. And he would go all day and just preach and preach and preach to, and, and the thing is folks, back then when they would preach, sometimes you'd have up to 20, 30, even 40,000 people listening. There was one time I was reading about in Wesley's journal where he started preaching just in the city square and there's just a few people there, and as he's preaching, by the time he's done, there's a thousand people there, and he tells them, I'm going to be back at five. So he leaves and has lunch and all and does other things. And when he comes back at five, there's like 10 or 20,000 people. This was the kind of thing that went on. And so uh, it, it was a great revival movement. And originally, as I said, these guys were all Anglicans, all Church of England ministers. They originally had no intention of starting another church. They just wanted to bring revival and bring the new birth and bring a biblical emphasis and what, you, what the pietists called heartfelt religion to <clears throat> the sort of dead and orthodox and dry churches of the day. And the corrupt churches. Many of the churches were just corrupt. The, 
the, the vicars, the pastors were drunks, they were womanizers, they were corrupt in many ways. They were taking bribes, and uh, the church was corrupt, and the church was dead, and lifeless. These guys brought revival. And so, especially Wesley and Whitfield, they traveled extensively. As I said, Wesley over, over 250,000 miles on horseback, and uh, over 250,000 converts that he organized into societies. He was a, a tremendous administrator and organizer. Whitfield wasn't so much about that, but he was probably a greater preacher. He was one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. And Whitfield's preaching, he went up and down the United States. He came to America seven times. And he went up all across all the colonies preaching. And really, there's a sense in which George Whitfield uh, powerfully influenced the founding of our country, because this was before the Revolution. He powerfully influenced um, the founding of our country. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, our, the way we believe and the way our, you know, there were many people who were converted under his ministry. Even, even Benjamin Franklin used to go and listen to him. Franklin never got saved. But he really uh, admired and listened to uh, George Whitfield. Um, but by the way, um, Wesley opposed the American Revolution, and so when it was when it was about to happen, many of the Methodist leaders returned to England because they, you know, they wanted part of a of a group that's fighting against their home country. And uh, Wesley also, many people don't know this, he vehemently opposed slavery and wrote scathing denunciations of it. I've read some of it; it's powerful stuff. Um, but, you know, I just couldn't believe it, but there were actually Methodists in the South, in America, back then, who were compromisers. Just like today, we have people who compromise with the issue of homosexuality, for instance. They're afraid of upsetting people. They don't want to be too controversial. They don't want to be too condemning or negative. So they compromise with sin that's obviously written against in Scripture. Same thing with slavery. How can you possibly think that God would have you force another man to do your work for you and you don't pay him. That's that's robbery. Plus they kidnapped the Africans and all oh, they treated them harshly and cruelly. It was completely satanic and wicked slavery was and Wesley said so. But in the South many Methodist leaders said, Well, you know, we got a lot of our people are slave owners and plantation owners and that's how we make a living. They give tithes to us and stuff and we don't dare upset them. So they wouldn't preach against slavery. Can you believe it? And so that led to the creation of the, of the African Methodist Episcopal denomination, which is, you know, you'll hear about the AME Church, right? There was a shooting at the AME Church, if I remember right, up in, the, what was it, South or North Carolina? And there's, you hear about a, AME churches, and I never really knew what they were um, until I started studying this stuff. And uh, let me see, I'm just adding some. And so the African Methodist Episcopal denomination, see, the Methodist, remember, uh, the the Reformation in England created the Church of England, right? When they broke from from the Roman Catholic Church, and so uh, that was the predominant church in America, and it was called you know the Church of England. Well, when the Revolutionary War happened, uh, it wasn't popular to go to the Church of England. <laughs> We're fighting England. We hate their taxes and all that. We don't like what they're doing to us. We're not going to go to the Church of England. So that's when the American uh, Anglicans changed the name to to call themselves Episcopalians. And, and then, so, in the Anglican Church is where the Methodist revival movement uh, primarily got started and moved a lot. And so, in America, they called themselves the Methodist Episcopal Denomination. And, uh, you know, that may sound strange, but you see that you can see the connection, because Episcopalians are Anglicans, and the Methodist revival took place in the Anglican Church in the beginning, so they were called Methodist Episcopalians, and then the black denomination is called the African Methodist Episcopal Denomination, AME, okay? And so um, uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church was the first name for Methodists in America after the Revolution. So it's real important to know about the Methodist movement. It, it, it swept across, and the first bishop over here was Francis Asbury. My my parents uh, used to go to a church called Asbury Methodist. My sister still goes there, named for the first bishop. He was a great organizer himself and traveled all over the place, preaching and bringing people in. And, and so the Methodist movement was a movement that started with fire and revival, and it was about being born again and and uh, about living a holy life and, and uh, getting together with other Christians and living in close fellowship and confessing your sins to one another and, and, 
and uh, striving together for holiness. And so, out of that came the next movement that I'm going to talk to you about, the holiness movement, which is another important development as we're moving along through time here. You see, John Wesley um, had various distinctive doctrines. He was quite theological, actually. And uh, he was more devoted to practical things like forming churches and, you know, uh, even medical cures and, and stuff like that. But he was also quite theological. And some of his doctrines are controversial. One of the main doctrines that he believed in, that I myself follow, uh, is today called Wesleyan Arminianism. Because, you see, George Whitfield was a Cal Calvinist. He was a Methodist, but he was a Calvinist. By the way, Methodism is named because they had methods, which are really nothing more than spiritual practices. They, they organized people. They, were, they used these spiritual practices to, to enhance their spiritual lives, which is something we all have to do. That's what discipleship is all about. But they were called Methodists because they had this method. Well, anyway, uh, Wesley was a Wesley. He believed in Arminian theology that, uh, you know, is, is different from Calvinism. And uh, Whitfield was a strict Calvinist. And so Wesley developed his theology and it came to be called, today it's called Wesleyan Arminianism because he came after Arminius and he kind of tweaked it and developed it. And of course, Calvinism is kind of Augustinian Calvinism, right? But anyway, that was one of his distinctive doctrines. But he had another one that's even more distinctive and that was what's called Christian perfectionism. Wesley taught that a person who really believed and pursued God wholeheartedly could experience what he called complete sanctification. And what that meant was that sin would be basically eradicated from your life. If you really seek God, you can get to a place where sin is eradicated from your life. Now, a lot of people think, man, that's just crazy, and they don't want to even entertain the, 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 to hear about it, you know. But actually, um, you know, if you read what he wrote about it, it's not as crazy as you might think. He said it was something that he experienced in his life. And, uh, you know, he said it was kind of like a thing that you could enter into. And sometimes you enter into it for just periods of time and then you kind of drop back out of it. Uh, it's kind of like Peter walking on the water. You know, he walked on the water. That was supernatural. Then he doubted and he sank. But then he cried out and Jesus saved him. And to Wesley, I think it was kind of like that. You can actually get to a place where you're walking with the Lord. You're not living in sin. Your sin is kind of eradicated from your life and you're sanctified. He admitted, though, that this mostly happened to people just before death, um, you know. Um, and also, look, you got to understand this, too. He wasn't saying people were perfect in, in every sense of that word. In, in other words, you, weren't, you didn't arrive at perfection of knowledge where you knew everything, or you were perfect in your theology and you knew everything about God just right, or perfect in your understanding. All he meant by Christian perfectionism was just that you could be free from outer, outward, overt kinds of sins. That's what he meant. Now, I've done some study about it, and um, I, I conclude, I'll tell you the truth, I think that it's really just a question of semantics. Um, if you really study what he wrote and everything, I don't think he's really saying anybody's sinless or perfect in this world. I think what he's just saying is, you know, it's overt sins. You don't commit overt sins. You know, blatant sins, willful sins. And really, it's a question of semantics because it depends on how you define sin. See, this is the thing. What I notice is a lot of Baptists, for example, or Presbyterians, in my experience, tend to define sin as being less than Jesus. So um, if you're not uh, as patient as Jesus, that's sin. If you're not as loving as Jesus, you know, that's, that's sin. If you are, you do stuff for, you know, selfish motives, that's sin. So if you're, if you define sin as kind of like not being like Jesus, I don't meet up to the standard of Jesus. Well, then of course, you know, we're all just hopeless sinners, right? Hopeless. I mean, everything we do. In fact, some Calvinists will even say this, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs, even the plowing of the wicked is sin. Why? Because the farmer's doing it for selfish motives. If you help a little old lady across the street, you just did it so that you would look good. So it's selfish. So even that is sin. Even good things you do are sin. So if you define sin that kind of way, why everybody's just totally steeped in sin and you'll never get over sin. And anybody like Wesley who says you can, they're just nuts or they're lying. Right? But that's not what, uh, that's not what Wesley was meant by this. That's not how he was 
um, defining it. Uh, see, look, let me put it to you this way. Did you ever hear a person stand up in church and say, folks, please pray for me. Every week I'm just tempted to rob a bank or rob the 7-Eleven. Do you ever hear anybody say that? No, we don't say that, do we? Why? Well, because robbing a bank is not something that, oh my gosh, I just kind of lost my temper and I robbed the bank. Oh my gosh, it just sort of slipped up on me. I didn't mean to. And next thing I know, there I was with a gun robbing the bank. <laughs> no, you just don't do that. You, you know, you don't say, pray for me. I'm really, you know, I often think of murdering somebody. You know, we just don't do that. The, mo the normal person doesn't have a problem with things like that. We just don't do it. And so Wesley's talking about, you know, obvious, overt, willful sins that you just say, you know what, I'm going to commit adultery. He says, you can get to a place where you don't do that. Well, I totally believe that. If you have the Holy Spirit in you and you, you live seeking God, you just don't want to do stuff like that and you don't do it. Now, could you slip up? You know, you got into sort of a compromise situation and then the next thing you know, oh man, you got tempted and then you fell. Yeah, you could do that. But it's, you know, could you lose your temper and you hit somebody and you kill them? You know, maybe you could do that. But I mean, you're not going to think, hey, I'm going to go murder somebody or I'm going to rob a bank. So what he's talking about is that kind of thing. He's saying overt, blatant, willful sins. You can get to a place where you're free from all that sort of thing. Now, so um, let me just, let me just, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, let me just wrap up uh, with one more thought and then we'll go to the, we'll go to the next one. Uh, we'll do a, a whole nother video. But I just want to let you know that, uh, we, you know, pietism kind of led and, and, and influenced the development of Methodism. And then Methodism developed and out of Methodism came something that we would call the holiness movement. And so that, that all came out of this idea of entire sanctification or Christian perfectionism. And so um, that is a development that uh, I wanted us to understand, and I'm going to tell you more about it in the next discussion.